info site. Um, we'll just make sure that you all have access to this and others have it as well. But thank you, first of all, everyone for attending this morning. I know we're up against a 4-H webinar at the same time <laughs> today, and so I really appreciate that you've all jumped on. Uh, many of you are familiar with Webinar Wednesday. We do this once a month um, in regards to just a variety of programming needs, issues, kind of a lot of times around our internal um, staff development needs. And today it's my pleasure to introduce a, a colleague from the University of Minnesota Extension, Scott Chasden. Scott has, I've known Scott for a number of years. Um, he is a great person to know because he is a strong evaluator. He is an evaluation and a research specialist for the Center for Community Vitality with the University of Minnesota Extension. And I just always um, am so appreciative of his knowledge, his ease in explaining these things to us. Um, and I know the great work that he does over in Minnesota with the specialists and agents there, educators, as well as across the nation. Scott's just kind of a really well-known um, evaluation specialist across the nation and extension. So I always am appreciative of his, his um, friendship, his co collegiality, and especially the fact that he's coming here today to North Dakota via a webinar to share with us the but for attribution principle, which is something I think we all need to be more aware of as we do evaluation, as we think about how we're showing program impacts. So I, I the chat box is open. If anyone has questions, I'm going to try to watch for those, Scott. Oh, thanks. I, you know, and you can surely see them as well, but we're going to have you roll through this. We have about an hour. Um, so please think about questions you want to ask Scott in regards to this as well. And I hope, Scott, that you'll share with us some of the literature you've written on this. I know there's some good, um, good stuff out there, too. So there's other resources that people can follow up with. All right. Thank you. And we'll let you, we'll let go ahead, Scott. All right. Well, thanks, Lynette. Um, so I'm happy to be here today. So I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview of what I'm planning to talk about here um, during the webinar. Um, a little bit about why um, it's important to collect indicator data, um, and and in general. Uh, background on the, the National uh, Community Resource and Economic Development uh, Working Group that I've been part of and Lynette has been part of um, for many years. Um, and then the, the specific North Central Region indicators that each state in the North Central Region of, of Extension it, uh, participates in every year and has since 2010. And then a little more about what we mean by impact, and what we mean by this but-for rule. And then probably the most important part is some tips that I have um, for collecting this kind of impact information. Um, but I have to say that every state has unique ways of doing this, and we by no means have it all figured out in Minnesota. This is a very challenging task. Um, but we do have some guidance and some things that have worked pretty well for us. So, and then, hope, yeah. Scott, I'm sorry to interrupt. This is Lynette. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. So I just want to make one really quick note as I see your overview that the group of people that are on this call are probably not going to be super familiar with the North Central Indicators. They don't all work in community vitality. They work in agriculture. They work in um, just, just a little heads up. So I wanted to give this group a little heads up on that, too, that um, what Scott's going to talk about with these indicators are something we've collected kind of in the community and leadership area, um, economic development area, but it might not pertain to the rest of you. Okay, I just wanted to throw oh, that out that's there. That's helpful. I did not realize that, so thank you. <laughs> yes. um, I, do, I do think that people in other areas of extension may have some indicators that I know youth development for sure does. Um, but I, I, so there may be some, some regional or national indicators that you're asked to contribute to. And if not, um, that part might seem a little irrelevant, but parts of this, I, I promise, will be relevant. <laughs> OK. Um, so with that, I'm going to go on to uh, just a, a little bit about sort of how this happened and how I came to be involved in this work 
is that um, the CRED, which is Community Resource and Economic Development, sort of one of the four major areas of programming in extension across the country, um, that group um, has uh, some people, this uh, working group that I've been part of, that has come together for several years to try to figure out how we can tell our story, uh, largely because this community resource and economic development is a relatively new and unknown part of extension. And so it's more important for us perhaps than for 4-H, which has been around forever and has all this credibility built up over the years. It's important for us to sort of build that credibility and understanding of the work that we do in community development. Um, so that's part of the context for why this indicator stuff has happened um, and why um, we've developed these methods um, of reporting of the indicators. Um, and so Lynette has been on this team. Uh, we have people from each region of the country. Um, and it looks like there's nobody from the Southwest, but that's, it's true. There's no one in the Southwest, but the Western region is very large for extension. So we have Rebecca and Paul out West, uh, but they're in the Northwest. Um, and we come together on a monthly basis and and really talk about ways to strengthen evaluation and impact measurement in community development extension work. Um, the benefits of collecting indicator data, and I'll show you what we mean by that if you're not familiar, um, is that it gives these numbers that we can aggregate across states in a region that really are compelling to funders at the state and federal level. Um, that that investing in extension, uh, specifically community development work, is a good investment. Also, the process of collecting impact data can be really helpful for scholarship. You can write articles, like for Journal of Extension or other journals in more topical fields that are more practice-oriented journals, um, around the impacts of your work and where you describe the programming and then show the impact with data that makes that can make for a very effective scholarly article. Um, and so that's, that's something that we've encouraged people to do. And also you can use the evaluation data to feed back into the program to make it a better program, um, especially if you're, if you're clever when you collect your evaluation data, you can figure out, well, um, the program seems to be working for this audience, but not, uh, not this other audience, or, or this aspect of the program might be working better than other aspects. So you can tease out those lessons while you're also collecting impact data. So the North Central indicators, um, there's this uh, North Central Regional Center for Rural Development, which is at Michigan State University. Um, Way back when this started, that center was at Iowa State University. And for years, they've been posting on their website these annual reports. And I'm going to show you uh, in a minute an uh, uh, infographic they use um, to show some of the data. Um, but this is aggregated information across the, I think, 12 states of the North Central region. and. Um, we in the North Central are proud of the fact that we've been doing this longer than any other region in the country. The Southern region has started to do this, um, and two other regions in the country have tried, <laughs> but they don't have enough programming in community development and enough staff to really be able to have good data about impact. So um, this has mostly been North Central and the South. and the, and. This is an example of this infographic, and it might be a little hard for you to see, but this is this most recent report from the North Central Regional Center for Rural Development. So they have all, all this data, how many states reported um, the number of business plans that were developed, and how many states reported um, how many businesses were created, and then they give the number, and they use cool infographics. So you can imagine that when you present this information to either a state legislator or a con congressperson when they're not, you know, too busy trying to keep the government open, um, when, they, <laughs> when they have an attention span, um, they are interested in these numbers and can really use them 
um, to justify spending money on extension. <clears throat> so now I'm going to talk a little bit about impact and what we mean by that. And um, so you, I'm going to show a logic model in a minute, but impacts are usually the thing that is way at the right side of the logic model where you have your short-term and your medium-term and your long-term outcomes. And what we mean by those long-term outcomes are impact, or also called impacts, which are changes in conditions that can be attributed to the extension program. So there's a, there is a slight nuance between a, a, an outcome and an impact. And what I like to think of it is, um, the outcomes might have happened even without the extension program. <clears throat> An impact is something where you can feel fairly certain that that impact would not have happened if not for the extension program. So that's a double negative, but that's your but for rule right there. It's this idea that this thing would not, would not have happened if not for extension. And so that we, some people call that attribution, and some people prefer to call that contribution. I don't really care which term, but it is this idea that extension played a pivotal role in something good happening in a community, or in, if you're not in community development, in families, or for youth, or in agriculture, or in the natural resor in natural resources. But Whatever the, the field you're in an extension, the impact is that difference made by extension in that thing happening. So I mentioned um, logic models. So years ago, there were several logic models created uh, for buckets of work in community development and extension. And I know that other parts, youth development, fam uh, family development, nutrition, education, all have logic models for different um, kinds of programming they do. <clears throat> so this is just an example of one where um, for community economic development work. And this one is from this resource that I hope was shared with you. It's called the Impact Indicators Tips Booklet. Um, it, there was a picture of it on the first slide, and it's a free resource available on the web. Um, so these impact indicators that um, are mentioned in here are described more in that TIPS booklet. But I want to just draw your attention here to <clears throat> the long-term results. That far right column are the things we typically talk about as impact. Um, now, in the North Central region, when we like when Minnesota reports our data on these indicators, some of them are actually not long-term impacts. So some of them are participation indicators. It's that third column under participants. Who are we serving? How many people are we serving? Are we serving uh, underserved populations? Um, so those questions are important, but they're not impacts, uh, yet, yet we still want to report them. And then some of these uh, things that we report are actually medium-term outcomes. They're more individual level actions um, that participants in our programs, that things that we want people to do differently as a result of our program. So they're more on that individual level. This is a nice way I, uh, to explain, um, this is also from that TIPS booklet, what is the different, what is an impact? So you could have um, an indicator. In this case, we have this indicator, the number of community or and organizational policies or plans implemented. This is actually one of the indicators we report on in our, in our report to the North Central region. And so looking at the year 2010, you can see that um, there were th a total of 37 community or organizational plans implemented that we know about. Uh, from our work with communities. But 15 of those would have happened anyway. So they would have happened um, even if extension hadn't delivered its program. And the, so the, it's that difference between the 15 and the 37, which is 22. There are 22 impacts that you can actually say extension played an important role. 
And those are the ones that you can legitimately report as impacts. So I'm going to get to talking a lot about, well, how do you find that out? How do you find out how many impacts you did? And how do you figure out which ones you can claim credit for? That's the, that's the hard stuff, but that's really uh, an important part of our follow-up um, with communities and with stakeholders in communities who are not part of extension um, to ask them, did these things happen? And then the next question is the but-for question. Would these things have happened if extension hadn't delivered its program? That's kind of the overall uh, gist of this but-for rule. So I apologize if you're not in uh, community development work, but these are the indicators that we report for community development work. Uh, so a number of business plans developed, number of community or organizational plans or policies developed, number of, I won't read them all, but you can see what they are. And then the North Central Regional Center gives us de these definitions. And they say, when they give us the definitions up on top, general principle, attribution, someone from outside extension must be willing to state the program produced the result. And um, the, you get into some questions about, uh, caught, you know, this attribution thing. Extension doesn't have to get full credit, uh, but it, it is this but for rule. If without extension, this thing probably would not have happened. And usually, people, stakeholders, people in communities can tell, they can tell you, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty darn sure this would not have happened if not, if not for extension. So um, here I have a picture of a tort, but that's not the kind of tort we're talking about, which is <laughs> the origin of tort law. Uh, the but-for rule comes from tort law, from this idea, and I, I, I can't see my notes here, but um, it's it's called proximal cause. Um, that like in a, that a defendant has to show you have to show that the defendant um, pr probably caused a financial harm to someone else. But it's called proximal cause, and and this but for rule is used. Would this harm have happened? if not for the actions of the defendant. I guess that's where this all comes from. Um, and uh, so the way that this gets interpreted for our use is this definition. Someone from outside extension is willing to state that the extension program was a crucial factor in producing the program's impact. That definition comes from a former colleague of mine, George Morse, who was our associate, he was our senior associate dean. He's an economist, and he was here in Minnesota for many years, and now he's retired. But he worked, I worked with him to, to write that impact indicators tips booklet. And um, so his language is an improvement here, was a crucial factor, is an improvement over, like saying the extension program caused the impact, because we know the world is complex. There are many other entities out there other than extension who are doing good things with us. So the point is that we played an, a, an important role. That's good enough. Most people who fund extension would think that's good enough. And I'd be interested in dialogue about this later if you think that's not true. Um, but my experience is that state legislators, county commissioners, would all feel like if you say extension played a crucial role, that's going to be good enough for them to justify funding us. Um, you use the but for rule after a project is done. So it's it's retrospective. Um, you're looking back and you so people know the history of what has happened since extension came in and did its programming. And they can see what um, you know, what, what happened, and they can directly connect it or not to something extension did. And this, uh, this notion of someone from outside extension is very important. You, you can't just rely on your own people to do this. You have to ask people from outside. Uh, otherwise, it doesn't really have a lot of credibility. 
So now I'm going to get into talking about some tips. Um, really, the rest of the whole the, the webinar is all about things that we've learned uh, that are good to do to get information on impact. So very simply, you're going to be following up with community stakeholders. Um, there's a variety of methods to do that. You can use a survey, but you know people don't like to respond to surveys these days, so that's tricky. I have some tips for that later, but you can also just get on the phone and ask people some questions. And you want the questions to be these but for types of questions. So for example, would your group have developed the plan if you hadn't participated in the extension program? And so there, there's clearly an indicator here about whether plan, community plans were developed. So in this case, would your group have developed that plan if you hadn't participated in this program? Um, but if the, if the intervention or if the program is more individual level, what is one thing you have done differently as a result of the extension program? Because uh, that would be an impact. We do a survey in Minnesota with all of our extension educators in community vitality at the end of the year. And um, we ask them to fill this out. It's done in Qualtrics um, survey software. And they go in and they this you fill it out. Um, so let's say I'm reporting. At, I know that I had participants who increased their leadership as a result of my program. I click on that circle. And then it takes me to the next screen, which is to describe the progress you are reporting for that indicator. So that's where you type in the specifics of what that impact was, whether for us it's typically not about individuals. Even that leadership one, we tend to collect that one in, in evaluation surveys that we do at the end of the program. So. Uh, this case, let, let me go back here. Let's just say it's the number of the third one, number of community or organizational plans or policies. That's one that we do a lot. And so our educators would go in and then type in the details about the community plans, the name of the community and the type of plan. And then they would put in the contact person outside of extension that we can call or email to get a little more uh, cl clarity about the role extension played and to get that but for attribution. Would this have happened if not for extension? So that's the idea that you collect the information from your own people and then you follow up. This seems labor intensive for an extension educator or agent to do. So I'm going to talk about some alternatives later on for um, perhaps using students to collect some of that information. <clears throat> so here we have um, some more tips. Um, so for stakeholder follow-up, my suggestion is that you first either survey or interview your extension staff people or have that part of their annual reporting and get the names of the community stakeholders and then conduct either an interview or survey with those stakeholders. One thing we do is we start with a survey to the stakeholders. And if they don't fill out the survey, we call them. <laughs> so, you know, we try to do the easier method. But if they, if pe you know, people hate surveys. So if they don't do the survey, we, um, we try calling them. Um, and make sure, making sure to have questions that are worded in a but for way. Would this thing have happened if not for extension? So what ends up being important is to know, to keep track of who are your local program champions or your, your people in a community who know about extensions work, perhaps have been direct customers of your programs. And the thing about these people is, uh, is the more you can keep an ongoing relationship with them through newsletters or you know um, regular mailings of information, um, the more you can keep up with these, what we call alumni, the more likely they're going to be to respond to your surveys and to give you that information, sometimes even just voluntarily. Sometimes 
we, people will say, oh my gosh, look at this thing just happened in our community and it was directly connected to your extension program. So the stronger those relationships, post-program relationships are, the better. Also, when you deliver your program, it's important to sort of let people know that you're going to, I'm not going to say bother them, but you're going to want to go back and check with them to find out how they have used the information extension has provided. That that's a really important part of our reporting to our funders and that we need to be able to justify our, our existence, that we need to show our impact and that, you know, people um, need to understand that we will be getting in touch with them even after the program is done. And here's where I also really, um, if you have the possibility of connecting with students or connecting them to this uh, evaluation process, it's great. I'm lucky enough where I, I get to have a 10-hour-a-week graduate research assistant every year, and um, that, is, that student is the one I ask to help me uh, do this follow-up with community stakeholders. So, I apologize if you're not in community development. Um, in community development, we often use this community capitals framework to think about some of these but for questions. And there are eight community, or there originally were seven, but now we think of eight community capitals. And so it's a nice way for us to think about, um, you know, a strong community has all these capitals or assets going for it, and they interact in really important ways. Um, but in terms of like civic capital, which is like, you know, people being engaged in civic life, um, we have these questions. Uh, did And these questions, by the way, were written for um, extension, like applied research offerings, where we do community economics research for communities on their retail trade market or um, on their uh, on an economic impact of some something that's happening in their community so we we do the report and then we ask them did the study or report influence any community or economic development decisions and that happens to be one of the north central indicators as well um, and that's you know it's kind of a weak but for question but when you get them to describe the influence you can try to put together how, you know, whether, whether or not the, this thing would have happened without extension. So you have civic impacts, human capital is, is you know, new knowledge and skills. Um, so we have questions about those. Financial is obviously about increased financial resources available for community development purposes. So here we have two questions that get at that. Then the next slide, we have some examples of questions around social capital, built capital, cultural capital, and natural capital. If you're not in community development, you could think about if there are frameworks in your extension work that um, would influence these but for questions, it's sort of impact frameworks, I guess you could think of them. I know, for example, in, in um, nutrition, uh, they, they sometimes connect with public health. And um, in public health, they always talk about policy systems and environmental change. So you could think about impacts in each of those three buckets as well. And you could have questions about those. Have there been small p or large p policy changes in your organization connected to extensions program. Like, like one thing you hear a lot about in nutrition education is like a child care doing a better job making healthy meals for the kids or schools getting rid of their vending machines. Um, stuff like that, uh, those are impacts that are probably um, attributable to extension programs. Um, so Lynette actually trained me in this method, <laughs> ripple effects mapping, but uh, it turns out ripple effects mapping is a wonderful way to collect um, information on, um, on impacts. And you can ask, 
either at the end of a ripple mapping session or perhaps afterwards with a key stakeholder, which of all these ripple effects that you've talked about could you really say wouldn't have happened without the extension program? And we've actually done that. And the, the fun thing about ripple mapping is sometimes you collect impacts that really were not about, they would have happened without extension, or there's other agencies doing good work that are collaborating with extension and the impacts are more attributable to them. But you can go through the ripple map and really figure out what, what stuff that, that happened in the community really um, could be attributed to extension. And sometimes I even go in the ripple map and change the color of the text to red to show that it's actually an extension impact. So I think that's all the slides I had. And I envisioned that there might be a lot of questions. And I'm intrigued if you're not in community development. Um, if there are ways that you could think about using these but for questions and stakeholder follow up, or maybe you're already doing it, but you want to do it more systematically. So I would encourage you to go in the chat pod, which I have open, I can see, and type in examples. I guess my first question is, what are you doing right now to collect information on impacts? in communities or in families from your work. Hello? Ah. Hey, we're, we're out here, sorry. We're just... <laughs> that was a, that's a bad feeling. <laughs> I know, nervous thinking. <laughs> okay. I got, I got somebody with me. We're going to type some more here, Scott. <laughs> oh, very. Uh, so people working in food systems, that, that work is so perfect for ripple mapping. So Lynette, when you did that, did you include a discussion of sort of what do we attribute to extension or did you feel like that wasn't necessary or um would could you go back and do that or would that I, be useful i actually did because i facilitated it and it was just a week ago it was such a cool um activity we had a there's a group there's a an effort in the fargo moorhead area it's called first fridays at b it's it's uh the first friday of every month people that are interested in food system work, uh, urban agriculture, uh, nutrition, all kinds of different topic areas around food, they attend, they go to the fur, they go to the Theater B in Moorhead. It's a theater and it's community theater. And so it has just been really fun. They've been doing it for a year. They've got a different topic area. And so they asked Extension. Extension kind of has led this with one of our staff members. There's others, there's other entities involved. But we did um, ripple map after one year what had happened. And we, we did one focus group with people that were speakers or presenters at First Fridays at B, and one focus group with people that attended only First Fridays at B. And I asked them specifically how much they could attribute to extension, because they knew the extension people were there, too, and, and they were involved in this. But um, I did ask them specifically that follow-up or kind of probed for that a lot and so that was that was fun to be able to get those responses and um there's some programs we've used that rochelle veteran is on too she just talked about the on uh, a fort well she's the fall 4-h volunteer impact study but i did some work with her down in a at a reservation site where we did some ripple mapping and that was all because of the extension program we kind of knew that's what it was so uh -huh. we have been learning it took a while, <laughs> but to specifically ask that. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it sometimes feels awkward. Mm -hmm. um, and in some situations where extension is working in collaboration with other entities, it's, it's, um, it's actually not appropriate. Um, and so it's, um, 
you know, you don't want to say, like we, we did a project, our food systems educator, one of them, did a project in collaboration with a whole bunch of agencies on the east side of St. Paul, and it's around food systems and access to healthy food. And, you know, there were a lot of players and organizations, and Extension was just one of them. So we did a ripple map, but it it would have been really gross to sort of say, well, what did Extension do here? We could do that later. Um, once we had the ripple map, we could revisit and say, okay, here's the things that Extension really contributed to. But um, in that large context, it would have been kind of like mean, or not mean, but just inappropriate and made it look like we're the big, you know, 800 pound gorilla when we really weren't, we were just one player. Right, you're right. And, and, and only when people would suggest that because Extension offered this as one of the programs through this first Fridays, that's when we um, did this, you know, and rippled it out. But you're right, it is weird if it's not just your program. You gotta be careful with, you know, <laughs> how to attribute it. <laughs> so yeah, maybe Rochelle could talk about this 4-H volunteer impact study, and that's with Sam Grant, my colleague here in Minnesota as well. And um, so, uh, that's and, and I'm I'm imagining that 4-H does have these indicators that they contribute to um, nationally. So we, I think Scott, you helped Sam with look over our evaluation tool um, when we did that as a North Central Region partner or partnership. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so we wanted to find out specifically whether or what our volunteers. Um, received um, what they felt they received from being part of NDSU Extension and the 4-H Youth Development Program, what they gave to the program, what they felt they were impacting, and then the overall public value of 4-H um, Youth Development and them volunteering in their communities. And we just received great data back from Sam and had about a 30% participation rate in the North Central region, and our North Dakota volunteers were part of that. So um, now we're figuring out how we want to report that. But we specifically asked kind of what you recommended, the but for piece, they told us because of extension and 4-H youth development, they're volunteering for um, more boards. They feel more confident in communicating effectively. They feel like they can run meetings better. And then they feel like they've made a huge impact with the youth and the adults that they work with. So we have had some really cool data. Now we're just figuring out, we're just analyzing it and trying to figure out how to report it all. So yeah, that's um, but awesome. it's exciting. Okay, so Michelle typed that, I think we do surveys, but we don't always ask if it weren't for extension. So um, yeah, that you, if there's a way to sort of try to tweak those questions to get at that, because it is, it is hard um, to, and le like even some of the examples I showed, in, you know, they're not the strongest but for questions, um, but to, to figure out a way to tease out that piece like this this probably wouldn't have happened without extension because that does really sway any any policy maker whether it's at the county level or state level or nationally that's that stuff is more powerful and anyone else have examples of um, how they currently get this impact information about their work One thing that's mentioned in that um, Impact Indicators Tips booklet, and I, I hope you got a link to that, but you can just Google it also, Impact Indicators Tips booklet, because um, George did a really good job putting that thing together. I was a contributor, but not the lead person by any means. Um, but he mentions an article from Journal of Extension where um, I think it's called uh, By Workman and Shear. And so over the years, there's been a lot of stuff published in that journal of evaluation with evaluation data, and they analyzed all, all through the years how many of those um, publications featured actual impact data, 
versus you know stuff on customer satisfaction or or knowledge outcomes or even behavior change and only six percent of the articles actually got at impact <laughs> so this is this is a hard thing to do uh, to actually figure out how to measure and it's labor intensive because you have to go beyond our traditional customers to get data so uh, oh, Lynette typed, we do a lot of retrospective post then pre. Yep, so do we. <laughs> so especially that's a good thing to do when it's about like skills or things that people might, they might think they, they know more about at the, if you were to actually do a pre-survey, they might overestimate their skills. Um, and then they learn more and they realize, oh, I really didn't know that much about this. So that's where you want to use that retrospective design. And then you do get this pre and post change, which is nice to see. But then it's even beyond that, it's helpful to get people who know those folks. It's, you know, you've, it's not quite as much as a leadership 360 kind of thing, but that idea of getting someone else to vouch for the way that person stepped up their leadership and what they did in their community. Um, it, it's hard to get, but you, you often hear that when you do the ripple mapping. So Scott, do you have other suggestions besides ripple mapping? You mentioned phone calls afterwards. Um, so, you know, we do a lot of retrospective post and pre, and so somebody has delivered a great six week program and it's great. And you know, people are, um, learning things and you do this and it shows, yep, there's a difference from pre to post. That's all great. But we know that there's other things. We hope that there's other things that happen when they leave. Yeah. And so besides, you know, ripple mapping or you even mentioned follow up calls, what, what yes. other suggestions might there be and how many calls does a person have to make? It's just, <laughs> you know, it's just kind of like, uh, I think that's always a struggle with us because we think, oh, we just got to do a survey and we've got enough information, but we don't. It's not telling us, um, like you said, to get to the stakeholder. They want to know what difference we made. So any other suggestions? Well, so here's the things that we do. Um, we do, for all the participants in our cohort leadership programs, we do an annual alumni survey. We also use that information for our federal report uh, outcomes. Um, um, so the, we get a pretty good response from that survey. So it's all the people who completed a leadership program in that calendar year. And we have a few questions in there. Um, they're not the best but for questions, by the way, but they do get at, uh, at impact. We get a pretty good response from that survey, and it's only because we have this kind of continual um, newsletter um, that we send to program alumni. We keep in touch with them. We, we um, try to encourage people to be part of our, you know, Facebook and whatever social media presence. Um, so it's that ongoing um, communication with alumni that makes it more likely that they will respond to the survey when they get it. And then we also have, and we've published in Journal of Extension about something called the action items method, which is where you collect on the last day of a program, let's say it's a leadership cohort program, you ask people to write down up to five specific things they're going to do differently. So you're getting at behaviors, specific things they're going to do differently in the next six months as a result, you know, based on what they learned in the extension program. And then you do a follow-up survey. And in Qualtrics, you can customize the survey so that their specific action items show up in the survey. Uh, it's called embedded data, and it's kind of cool. So the whole thing, we've written a couple, an article about that, and I can share that. But um, they, you, get a, you get the survey um, asking you, to what extent did you follow up? Did you do these things you said you were going to do? And we use a scale of, you know, one to four, to not at all up to, to a great extent. Um, and that's a really cool idea, but we've run up against that issue where people don't necessarily respond. 
um, you don't get, you're lucky to get a 25% response rate, which, you know, that's not very good. Um, it's, that's, that's realistic, but it's just, you can't really say much with that. So I guess what goes along with that action items is also the continued engagement um, with former participants. And that's sort of the, if you want their data, you gotta, you gotta keep giving them stuff. <laughs> keep, keep the sort of channels of communication open. That's true. What else have we done? I think those are the big things. Like, in fact, right now, because it's federal reporting time, so right now we have our annual alumni survey in the field, I guess is what you say. It's, it's open now for people to fill out. And I don't even send the survey. I, it's sent by our educator whose name they would know. And, um, and she has, you know, she words the, the communications Last year, I tried to send it, and I used my wording, and we got a really crappy response rate. Um, and so I think that the more you can personalize this, the better. And, and she's, got, she's got the connections and the relationship there, so you have to build on that to get, to get the, the information. And that's why ripple mapping is so great, because it's very relational. And... Um, and people, like, like Rochelle says, people love it and you can collect great data. It's, um, it's a wonderful tool. And it is, and you can bring a lot of people together. And I just think yeah. about, I'm looking at who's on the call today and some of the programs that they provide. We have a, some parent education <clears throat> specialists and so all the connections they're making with parents, there's some great opportunity, <clears throat> excuse me, um, is uh, that like a divorce or um, like a uh, that kind of program for separating parents or is some, it? Some of it, but there's more. It's broader than that. Uh -huh. So there's a lot of different parent ed programs that happen uh -huh. in North Dakota. And, and a lot of them are, are many sessions, you know, and so there's quite a relationship that's been built. And some of these techniques would be great. They do a survey, you know, at the end, but some I think there's some additional things we might even be able to gather. Our food and nutrition um, agriculture, horticulture, our, our master gardeners, I think about the work that they do long-term, ongoing, you know, bringing in a focus group of them to kind of follow up with some of this about what's what they've done because of the program, but for the extension program, so <laughs> lots, of, lots of good ways we could, we could think about it. And I still think, you know, I mentioned this in the slides that um, setting that expectation while you while you have people in the room like we know we're done with this program but we really are going to want to know how you've used this information so you're going to hear from us and please 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 respond to the survey when you get it or just know that that's super important uh, for us to continue to offer programs like this oh. and setting that expectation is important Good point. Any other questions for Scott? I know we're running up, we got 50 minutes, but if, if we're finished, we'll certainly um, sign off too. Any other questions for Scott? Scott, if you're okay, <clears throat> we did tape this and we'll put it on our internal site so our staff can watch it. Um, also, your PowerPoint, We'd like to make that available to our internal staff. I mean, for staff, if that's if you're comfortable with that. Yeah. Um, I think it's helpful because people can kind of listen to you talk again, and and a lot of folks can't always be on our webinars, but it's just nice to have them taped too. I see somebody is typing maybe a question. I want to make sure we we respond to. Oh, Kim. Okay. Good. Thanks, Kim. But thanks everybody, and thank you, Scott, for showing us this. Um, again, I apologize, we jumped in and talked about, I know you were talking more about the community development side of things, but you know that's kind of everybody's world too. All of our staff are out there in these um, various places across North Dakota, every county's got an office, and a lot of our work is community development, even though it's, it's focused in agriculture or, or families, <clears throat> health, nutrition, whatever it might be, I mean, we're helping 
um, we're a key component of that community with the educational programs extension provides. So I think this is information that we can all use and um, we all have to do impact reports or statements. So <laughs> this is good. Yeah. All yeah. good. So thank you again, Scott. Thanks everybody for your attendance and we will put this up online and let you all know where the link is. And um, any last words, I don't know, Scott, from you? Uh, no, no, other than if you, um, if you have success collecting impact data on your program, write it up and send it off to either Journal of Extension or Journal of Human Sciences and Extension because you want, if, you're, if you figured out a good way to connect with former participants and get impact data, other people are going to want to know about it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. We're all, we're all in this together, right? Yep, yep. yep. <laughs> All right. Thanks again, Scott. Appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. Um, have a great day, okay? Okay. Thanks. Thanks.